Okay, yeah. so we've been uh, quite a bit of reading and stuff, and the aspect of it that, of, with which I'm very familiar is the CLA performance test. I've been to their workshops, which is an authentic assessment, and we'll talk about that at the end because we'll use that as a sample to work through. But given that, um, so if that is for today, or to, or to introduce you to the idea of authentic assessment, um, talk about what it is, how to define it, what it isn't, and give you some ideas about ways to um, integrate authentic assessment into your classwork. So, there we go. Any point, please stop and ask questions if you have them. So this is just a nice quote, quote, tell me I forget, teach me I remember, involve me, and I learn. So it's kind of a poster for authentic assessment. And authentic tasks, as we'll talk So there are two, two experts in the field um, as, you, as you read on it, two names come out. Brant Wiggins is one of them, and Fred Newman. This is accurate, isn't it, Fred Newman? Different Fred Newman. Anyway, Fred Newman are two authors that, you, that you'll see that talk extensively about and write extensively and research extensively about authentic assessment. So his, his definition is engaging in worthy problems or questions of importance in which students must use knowledge to fashion performances effectively and creatively. So it's pretty broad, broad design. The tasks are either replicas of or analogous to the kinds of problems faced by adult citizens and consumers or professionals in the field. I have all the sources at the end of the PowerPoint. I think if you're interested in them. So, an authentic task, so we'll talk a little bit about tasks, you know, learning strategies, and authentic assessments can be used interchangeably. A lot of times, whether they're a formative sort of a thing or, or more of a summative. Task. So generally we ask students to report a task is authentic when students are asked to construct their own responses um, rather than select one from one presented. And the task replicates challenges faced in the real world and it's typically multi-dimensional. So a lot of times tests have one very narrow focus, a very specific outcome that they're addressing. Authentic assessment um, tries to bring in various aspects of things. So two examples to, um, just for quickly. So golfing, when students are learning to golf, you may give them a written test about what is, what's the equipment, what are the rules, right? But if you really want to authentically assess how they golf, you're going to take them out of the golf course, right? So that's a very simple sort of authentic assessment. Not, so not only are they trying to hit off the tee, but they're looking at the lay of it. They may have weather problems that they have to counter. Maybe windy. So there are these multiple dimensional things, multi-dimensional aspects to it that you can't test, can't test on a test. First aid is another one. Students can know how to, what are the steps to take when somebody's got a broken leg? How do I triage a set of patients? Actually getting in the field and, and doing it and being, being a first aid provider for somebody is, is, a, is more authentic, it's real world, it's dirty, it's messy. And I'll stick with my numbers. <laughs> So when we look at the difference here between traditional assessment and an authentic test, we see it's really a continuum. It, when we look at something, it's not either one or the other, somewhere along the continuum. So we have traditional and on the other end is authentic. Traditional assessments is select a response, multiple choice. What's the right answer? At the other end is perform a task. So identify the components of a golf game, whatever, the equipment for a golf game, Shows how you can play golf. Okay, and there's a lot of things in between, right? So there's there's a continuum. Traditional assessment is a little bit more contrived. You're thinking of questions and things that replicate, but, but again, they're contrived. Never in real life do we are we hit with a, a situation where we say, pick one of the four, right, to do. Which is the best answer? True. Right, so authentic is more real life. Traditional assessment asks our students to recall, recognize. When we think of Bloom's taxonomy, they're usually the lower quadrants, knowledge, things like that. Authentic assessment is more along the, the higher range of Bloom's taxonomy where students are constructing, they're doing application, they're evaluating, creating. Traditional assessment is more teacher structured, student authentic, authentic, sorry, authentic assessment is more student structured, student focused. 
I have a little bit of heartburn when they use this terminology because we use indirect and direct in a little bit different way. But according to Mueller, traditional um, assessment is really indirect evidence of what a student knows. Authentic is more direct evidence of what a student knows. So you, you may be able to remember things on a test. Actually applying them is a different sort of aspect. Okay, so selective response. Lots of things we have. We have multiple choice tests, we have true and false, matching, fill in the blank, here's a diagram, label the air, things on the areas on a diagram. Areas on a diagram. Then we have constructive response. It's, there's product-like ones, so provide a short answer, essay to this, to this question. Develop a concept map that illustrates your mastery of the, of the, of the topic. Identify a theme, given a paragraph. Given some situation information, can you predict what may happen next? Or read this and summarize. So they're constructed responses, students are given prompts, they think and they go through. Or they're performance-like um, responses that are also considered constructed. So in a foreign language, you may be asked to read a paragraph. Are you reading it fluently? Um, you may take a typing test. How fast can you type? Solve a problem. Um, create a dance. Given these parameters, on the fly, create a dance. So these are sort of constructive response ideas. Um, then we move up, we've got, got actual full performances and projects, which are then now considered more authentic assessments. So you can see it is kind of a continuum that flows, goes through. So some of the basic elements of an authentic assessment, students are asked to develop responses rather than choose from a list of possibly correct answers. So multiple choice, true, false. So Authentic assessment tends to foster higher order thinking. Hopefully it aligns with classroom instruction. So here's the principles, I'm gonna give you a theory, now we're gonna apply it in class. Um, it may use student work that is collected over time. So e-portfolios are an example of, of authentic assessment. We're collecting student work, evaluating it over time, where the students are evaluating over time, looking for their growth, um, areas where they've learned, or areas where they're having trouble with. Um, it's based on clear criteria given to students, so when we talk about grading, authentic assessment, rubrics become, rubrics become very important. Um, one of the fun aspects of authentic assessment is that there are multiple interpretations. Generally, there's no right or wrong answer. You're given evidence, you do things, and, and you create it. It isn't that you're, you're, the goal isn't to arrive at the right answer, the goal is to go through the process. Use what you can to support your support your, your claim, your conclusion at the end. And then through authentic assessment, students will learn to evaluate their own work. So they produce what you've asked them to produce, they look at it, and they, they can look at it themselves in comparison to, to others in the class. They can see where they stand. They can look at it and figure out, oh, let's try this. Let's go back to this. Let's correct this. Gal, if you have students that, do you, having students evaluate their own work at the end of a semester and having them say, yes, I think I deserve this or I think I deserve that, is, is there any research that would say that students are more, what? well, I just read some research this morning that uh -huh. said that students who are poor students have a very false hope of getting a good grade and people and students who are have higher grades actually are more realistic. More critical of themselves. Uh -huh. um, I don't know the research that sounds like it makes sense. Have you heard, heard of anything okay. like, like that? I think that's why the better students are better students, because they're better at able at self self analyzing. Right. Um, I just wonder if I had for example, let's say I do a, an e portfolio, which I do, um, in forty nine ninety, and if I had the students evaluate maybe theirs and maybe the portfolios of others. How, what does that? I think they contribute. Students learn a lot from each other, that peer review okay. process, especially yeah. that's done on more of a formative basis. Turn right. it into your peers, let your peers evaluate, okay. give you feedback, make changes and to your portfolio based on your peer feedback. And it would be different at a 4990 level than it would be at a 1000 or 2000 right. level. I think okay. by the time you get to that, students are probably a little more clear about what is good and what isn't, 
and more a little more realistic, realistic about their own capabilities. Okay. Anybody else have ideas about that? So I do view production, uh, and so uh, a lot of the classes that I take is full on uh, authentic assessment because we have to do hands on. Uh, resources, we have to do the filming, we have to do the editing, mm -hmm. and so, and then we show it to our peers and then they, we critique it or say, we like this and we didn't like that. Um, and I think success sells success in a lot of places. The places where, you know, a test, although, I'm not a good test taker, but I'm a great life apply, you know, I can do a lot of app, uh, applying of what it needs to happen when right. it comes down to that moment. And I think that um, so, and sometimes it's just the the way they process the information. You know, they some people process it much easier through written, you know, papers and, and looking right. at it. But um, students, for me at least, I feel like um, as a student, seeing that I uh, be, having teachers give me a life, some sort of life application, helps me a ton more than anything else. Good. And when you say you've peer reviewed, you how do you, just in response to, yeah. to, to Colleen's question, do you get good feedback from your peer review? Uh, it's up in the air sometimes. Okay. So there's some people yeah. who just kind of say yes, and then there's some people who are there. I think the people who care about what you, they're doing give the critical feedback that I want, and those who kind of are half there uh, will give half the information good. and feedback good. you want. Another good point you, you raise, authentic assessment, one of the advantages of incorporating authentic assessment in, in, in your in your Classroom is some students are not good test takers. It gives them another opportunity to show their mastery, to show that they have learned your, you know, achieved your learning outcomes. Uh, it just gives them another chance. Um, another good point is some areas are more conducive to authentic assessment. I mean, they, the ideas are just, you know, limitless. You know, video production, dance, the creative sort of things. Other areas, accounting, though I can still see a lot of real world application, it's a little bit harder to come up with those Um, bottom line, authentic assessment seems to make sense to students. They get it. They're able to make the connection between the course objectives, the learning tasks that you've set, them, set out for them. They can pull it all together. And again, it's, it's a, that iterative process where they try something, they get feedback, they fix it. Um, it just resonates. It seems to resonate with students. So, when we talk about authentic assessment as this great thing, are we saying that traditional assessment is bad? It's no. We don't, we're not saying it's wrong, we're not saying it's bad. Um, authentic assessment is simply another option. Traditional assessment is really important to allow us to monitor performance. Are they getting the basic ideas? Are they developing the, the vocabulary that they need? Do they understand the basic com um, concepts? Traditional assessment is a very efficient form of assessment. We don't love multiple choice, but sometimes it's the best way to figure out if students are getting it, especially those lower level of of tax, uh, Bloom's taxonomy sort of thing where we just they just need to gain the initial knowledge. Traditional assessment is really good at doing, doing that. Um, it can be used formatively, so you can allow your students to take tests, retake tests till they get it, and you can use the same sort of thing summatively. This is it, this is the end of the semester, what you get is what you get. Um, authentic assessment should support improved performance, so students do something, create something, learn through the process a lot of times, because it can be really messy sometimes, some, some authentic, uh, authentic assessment. Tasks are sometimes ill-structured purposefully, so students have to think. And it frustrates, I know it frustrates some students when I, one of the ones that I use in my class is give me more direction. It's like, oh, that's part of the exercise, you figure it out. And so it's good, but it can be, it can be frustrating. Um, but it does help them rehearse for some of those real life sort of situations. Life is not simple. There's a lot of complexity to it. Um, and it's meant to focus on the impact of one's work in real, real world real, realistic contexts. Okay, so there's got to be catch, right? So developing good authentic assessments is very labor intensive. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of thought to, to put them together. Um, they're time consuming to develop. And they can take up a good part of your students' time as well. They're time consuming to, to complete. Um, it is a judgment. So you know, you're using rubrics, but you're still passing, making judgment. 
um, on performance. Different people may interpret the results very differently. So um, again, using a good rubric should help to, to address, address some of those issues. Um, so why bother? We've already pointed out it takes a lot of time um, to create. But it helps students to use the acquired knowledge so they're, they're learning their accounting skills. They're learning how to, the principles of communication that allows them to actually use, use these and show that you use them. Um, authentic assessment uh, embraces kind of that constructive sort of learning aspect. A lot of us learn as we do, to put, put the pieces together. It just helps cement the theory that we're learning with, with the application. Um, better integrates assessment with teaching and learning. Um, often, traditionally, when we, when we use assessment, we do the teaching, the students do the learning, and then separately, out here, we do the assessment. Authentic assessment ideally integrates all of it, so it's all happening at once, and not, it's not considered something, something separate. Um, and it, authentic, this, the bottom line thing is, is really critical. Authentic assessment provides multiple paths to demonstrate um, mastery of concepts. Students have different opportunities. Again, if, if they're not good at writing essays, if they're not good at writing papers, if you create something, construct something, they might have another opportunity to illustrate mastery. So, um, lots of different authentic assessments out there that, that people can do. Can you come up with some examples of what might be considered authentic in your field? Well, for me, my students having having to do that, you have to do a LinkedIn account and an e-portfolio. Okay. I think those are pretty authentic. The goal being to learn to market themselves. Oh, yeah, exactly. Okay. They have to do their you know, sort of some branding. Okay. Things, yeah. Okay. Good. You know, I'm looking at the authentic tasks, and I think I have a lot of authentic tasks within my structure of my classes. Okay. In the sense where we talk about a concept, mm -hmm. and then they have buddy exercises. Okay. So they get into buddies, and so they're actually applying, constructing, and applying what we talked about, kind okay. of a little smaller, with somebody else. So they're teaching each other, but they're also constructing their own responses. It, it can take in the concepts that we're learning. So that's how I chunk up my huge lectures okay. by talking a little and then applying and, then oh, and getting the hands on, but then this says involve me and I'll learn, you know, that they're they're actually saying, oh, now I, I understand how I'm applying this. Okay. But, um, they're, you know, they're given, you know, a case or a situation, right. and then they have to go ahead and think through it, but I, I want them to be involved in thinking critically too. Okay. But, I mean, that's more of a task, if I'm not assessing them, it's not like, they're giving a grade on anything because they actually keep them, and I don't see what they've worked on. Okay. But, I could, but what's at stake is I can call on people throughout the class and say, you know, we can talk about it. Okay, and the, so they're kind of developing a portfolio of these things almost as they go through your well, course? Well, they're developed, no, they're just keeping all of them on the different topics. Okay, so we'll not call that a portfolio. Okay. <laughs> no okay, but they've got a collection of things that they can refer back to when you... Yes, and then actually the, the exam that I develop is based on all the stuff that we've lectured on and the handouts and the buddy exercises and I have small group assignments where they get it to their groups and they actually do something. Okay, so you're using those authentic tasks to help them develop review materials. Yes, yes. Great. Okay. Good Tell me your name. I'm Janelle. 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 Sorry. It's okay. Um, I'm the director for here. Okay. okay. And um, I can think of one that I do where I lecture and teach them about the components of a good pulmonary rehab. Okay. But then I have them design their own program that meets all the requirements and oh, implements perfect. the components of a good successful community. And then how do you, how do they do they peer rate each other? Do you have a, a rubric that they you use? I have a rubric. Okay. But um, they have they actually create and they can choose how they do it. They can create the brochure. They can create a sales pitch presentation for their community. Design a, a little module that they would show this is how the classes are going to work for the components that I can have. So there's lots of different ways, and they can kind of choose. They have a certain number of uh, requirements, obviously, through the rubric, but um, they, they kind of have a little bit of.
freedom to. So it's that ill-structured aspect of it that lets them get. Yeah. And I have had some come to me and say, "What are you looking for?" And I'm like, "It's up to you." Yeah. That's the, yeah. the good part about. I mean, you can see what you're wearing the rubric. The rest of it is really your choosing. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting how some some students just embrace that, and others it just freaks them out. Yeah. It's like I want to give me guidelines. Yeah. And others just take off of it. Heather, do you have any? Sure. Um, I use this authentic assessment all the time in my stats classes, so I teach statistics. And um, really, I'm not interested that the students can regurgitate back to me. There are aspects I'm interested in their regurgitation of, but for the most part, I want them to be able to, when they go out, I want them to be able to pick something up and know what the people are talking about. I want them to be able to know how to run an analysis. I want them to know, be able to know those things. And so, for me, everything that we do is authentic. Not that's not true. We have some of the more traditional things, but. Um, Every problem that I give them on homework is here's a data set, here's your hypothesis, here are the things I want you to cover, go figure it out. And we do it throughout the semester on all of their homeworks and then um, it's mimicked in their quizzes so that it's the same format on their quizzes. And then I, it gives me an opportunity to provide them with feedback and say, or I use it also formatively, so it provides me with feedback that everybody's missing this concept or something that I need to put more information on. And then it builds to our kind of our last quiz where it's literally here is a data set. Go build a hypothesis, test it, include all the pieces that you need, and that's your, you know, that's your final test. So. And we've talked a little bit, some of the stats classes I had, you know, for the grant program, I knew how to run t-tests, I knew how to run analysis, I knew how to run regression. I didn't know when to use them. You know, they covered how to run them, but I didn't get the real world Here's this muddy situation, figure out what's best for you. I still can't do it, and I struggle with that. Oh, okay. <laughs> but but that, I, we miss that authentic piece. Um, and part of it is there's so much that you have to get through in a semester, and these do take time. How do you, how do you fit them in? So what I'm going to walk you through is the CLA is the Collegiate Learning Assessment. It's an, it's an assessment we subscribe to, we get here on campus, Colleen students take it in the spring. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, they call it a performance test. So it's, a, it's an assessment that's given to freshmen in, in the fall, given to seniors in the spring. The primary aspect of it is called their performance task. Um, and it's one example of an authentic assessment. But I think it, it's a fairly good program. I'll walk through, um, through how they've done it. I've gone to some of their workshops, so I'm, I'm pretty familiar with, with it. And I've developed one for my own class. I have a handout, but the print is so tiny, so small, that it's pretty much useless. I do, I do want to share, I do have them do something that is in the real world while you're doing the okay, slides. Thanks. Um, we have a case that they research a case and it says answer A, B, and C, and I tell them to answer it as A, B, and C, but you have to write an actual communication to a client. Say, and restate the synopsis, and do a synopsis of it, so they, the, the client understands you know what they're talking about. You know, as far, I understand your situation is X, Y, and Z, and you're trying to figure out how to do it, and then they research, and then they go back and not only tell them what they found in their research, uh -huh. but apply it to the client. And the, they sometimes they get stuck in the whole, this is what I can. It's like, well, wait a minute, you yeah. just left me hanging. What are we supposed to do as yeah. a client? Yeah. So they struggle with both. Mm -hmm. And I, I use Canvas, and I have turned it in and it, and I also have them not put their name on it, and I have a rubric. Oh, okay. And I actually go through and, and break them on the different criteria. Um, but they get a lot of feedback, and it's great for them to do something that's this is what they're going to do. You know, you have a client that has a situation, and you don't just research it and tell them what you found, but apply it. Yeah. Now, don't, don't leave them hanging. Right. Right. 
you know, because now I have this business. What, what do you recommend I do? Yeah. So this kind of assessment actually ties in nicely with that. So the way they the, construct the performance analysis, the performance test. So it's set up to assess analysis, problem solving, writing effectiveness, and writing mechanics. Um, by given students are given a couple open-ended questions in a hypothetical situation. So the basic components are a scenario. So they provide a story uh, for the student. I love this in perfectly. I did this just for you. Okay. <laughs> the student takes on a role, a specific role. They're given a, a task, and then they're given this document library. And as you go through the process of creating these scenarios, that's the biggest challenge, is creating this, this document library that they use then to answer the question. So, for, the, for mine, for the class I teach, the Wired Society, sometimes, um, you know, which is IT, IT related. So here's my scenario. So I've got um, a student who, a person who works um, at a school. No, this is a different one. This is one an example from them. Sorry. So here's the scenario. Dr. Eager said that Mayor Stone's proposal for reducing crime by increasing the number of police officers is a bad idea. So this is a city council sort of thing. Thing. Dr. Eager says, um, increasing the number of police officers will only lead to more crime. And I can show you the, the data that says that the more police officers we have, the more crime. It says, so Dr. Eager supported his argument with a chart that shows that counties with relatively large numbers of police officers per resident tend to have more crime than those with fewer officers per resident. So think about that for a second. At some point you go, well, duh, of course. but. But he's spinning it. <coughs> Secondly, um, Dr. Eager says we should take the money that would have gone to hiring more police officers and spend it on this drug program, because I can show you how this drug program is actually better. He supported the argument by referring to a news release by the Washington Institute for Social Research, Research that describes the effectiveness of the drug program. He also said there were other scientific studies that showed the program was very effective. So you can picture all the documentation that they're providing to support this argument. Third, Dr. Eager said that because of the strong correlation between drug use and crime in Jefferson, and he's got the data to support that, reducing the number of addicts would lower the city's crime rate. So we've got two com com competing um, proposals for resources. One says beef up police officers, the other says um, invest in this drug, drug program. So the student's job, their role is to look at both arguments, figure out which is the best, and make a re recommendation. Okay, so they've got the scenario, they've got their role, they've got their task, and then they've got their supporting document. Okay, so this, this is the individual making, so you can define the role, you know, quite, quite, um, quite clearly for what, what, this, what the person is supposed to do. So there's going to be a debate, and you have to release a report evaluating the claims. So you look at all this documentation mm -hmm. and make a recommendation. Who are you going to support? So the document library may contain a, a memorandum outlining the mayor's proposal, various comp data compilations. So we've got the report of drug use and crime in Jefferson. We've got a chart showing correlation between crime rate and number of officers by county. Um, we see the study of the effectiveness of the treatment program. Then it also includes an article from the local paper about the rise in drug-related crime. So you can see there are, there's data here of varying quality. There's just maybe an op-ed from the paper. There's actual data from, from an institute. Um, there's maybe some data that's been spun to try to give an impression that, that is not necessarily true. The student's task then is to read through the scenario from their assigned role and use the documentation to develop a sound argument. Then they write up a recommendation. So the writing effectiveness is a memo. So it, what they produce in this case is a huge, it's not too owner's degree, but it's a memo that if done well, will say, will show how they support it. There's no right or wrong answer. So it isn't that Dr. Eager or Mayor Stone is the right one. It's whatever the student decides is the most compelling evidence in how they write up the argument. And so that's, that's kind of the, the gist of the, of the performance test that CLA does. So the students, when they come in to take the CLA, they have an hour. They're given the scenarios. They're given all the background information. Then they're given a document library that they can, they can go through and, and use. 
So the, the performance test evaluates whether evidence is credible or unreliable. So the statistic that said that as um, police rates go up, crime rates go up, really there's a, an intervening variable here and it's population size, right? <laughs> That's, that really, and whether students can get that or whether they look at, the, at that data literally, so that if they include that in the argument or they discount it in their, in their memo, that gives you an, an idea if they understand that, that idea. Um, provides an opportunity for them to analyze and synthesize the evidence, um, allows them to draw conclusions, again, right or wrong, because how they support them. Um, a good, a good performance task response is well organized and logically developed, so there's writing components to it. Um, and then show how well it's written. So these are how the, the CLAs are all evaluated. And they've got very elaborate rubrics <coughs> that, that you can use for most of the performance tasks um, that, they, that they make available. Any questions on, on When that? students take that assessment then, they do that in an hour? They do that in an hour. Yeah, so it's, it's <laughs> Could you do um, that in an hour, Colleen? I don't know if I could do it in an hour. I guess I could. I mean, I knew what side I would go on just because of that. Because yeah. of the yeah. And that, that's and one that. of their scenarios. Um, yeah. They, they, I didn't make that one up. That, that's from their I guess. And you can go take it if you want. <laughs> you can. A lot of instructors, a couple of instructors have wanted to take it one hour. Um, so see about that. The, the document I showed you, which is it's a worksheet that allows you to go through and, and kind of come up, come go through these things. So the, the one I've done in my class, so, it, it, so it's an IT related, um, and in my class we talk about how technology diffuses or doesn't, you know, through a, through a society. Um, we talk about the different factors. Um, you know, we use the S curve where there's kind of that quick and slow adoption at first, that accelerated adoption when the majority of people, and then it tapers off. So the scenario I give them is that they're um, an IT person at a school, and they've been given a grant, and the teachers at the school have all submitted propo two, two proposals that they have to consider. So one instructor wants to buy very specialized software that's needed in the community, the skills for that software are needed in the community, but it can probably only reach 10% of the students in the, in the school. The other professor wants to have, buy software that's kind of old, but everyone needs it because it's a lower socioeconomic school. They don't have access to it at home, so they've got two compelling, two you know, competing arguments: one for that will impact a few students, but greatly, and one that impact a lot of students, not as greatly. So they just work, work through the the, um, the evidence that's provided, and they make a conclusion. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just whether you can support, you know, what's your conclusion. So they're kind of fun to work through. CLA actually sponsors two-day workshops where you can work, sit down and work through groups. Um, what I think would be really fun is if, as we develop authentic assessments, if we could collect what people do um, for these and share them. Because um, they do take some time, some time to develop. And sometimes you can adopt one and just tweak it a little bit for your own, for your own areas. Anyway, these are the sources um, for most of them. The authentic assessment information. And that's what I have. Any ideas? Any questions? Are you thinking of ways that you might be able to incorporate this? Got some more stuff. Some great some good examples. I think it's interesting, just as a student, uh, when 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 students struggle with the fact that you have you them such a this authentic, they like struggle with that direction. Um, I think it's because there's been a lack of that. You know, they just, they don't see. Um, it's hard for for many students to see where the connection is from what they're learning to what they're going to do in a real life situation. Yeah. And so having these um, assessments are super. So, because I mean, I run a crew, um, and I they've uh, for the studio downstairs, and all of them have taken most of them actually all of them have taken the essentials class, the basic class, and yet. Time and time again, I have to. We have to discuss. Say, okay, you know, remember the basics of what you've learned, and okay, you know, and apply it, and make sure you're improving what you've learned on. Right. Uh, and so I think it's, you know, it's useful. Right. Yeah, and if it gives you an opportunity to repeat those things that you learned early on, that if you don't repeat them, you lose them. If you can incorporate those, it just kind of ingrains them a little bit more into the, the neural paths or whatever. Um, yeah. From a practical perspective. Could. Some of 
things be used in gen ed assessment? Let me give you an example. Um, for public speaking, rather than do the old quiz questions that uh -huh. we've got right now, I mean, I'm thinking, why not do an authentic assessment where everybody is given their document library and they have to prepare a speech for a certain audience mm -hmm. for a certain thing? I mean, give them the scenario. I think it would be great. How would that? But okay. But here <laughs> is here's the here's the gotcha the gotcha part. How how do you authentically assess the assessment? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's what the, the, the researchers pointed out, but that is the challenge, even though you have a rubric. Right. Um, it's still hard, and, and one person may evaluate differently than another person, so that whole right. iterator of reliability. But the process, so I think it's a great idea. It's very labor intensive, but if over semesters, you could build several of these libraries, and then you just hand them out. Right. So yeah, again, it's a great idea. It just takes time. And you're hit. With Gen Ed, you have more of those students who are new, who are used to coming from high school, being told exactly what to produce. Right. Do this, you know. And it's one of the one of the drawbacks. I love rubrics, but, but one of the drawbacks of rubrics, I think, is that sometimes it confines, limits a student to how you know if all they do is follow the rubric, you kind of lose some of that serendipitous sort of creation that would occur if you didn't have a rubric. So yeah. you hate to see a limit limit what students produce. Um, okay. But yeah, you'd have to, I guess it, it would take practice, <laughs> right, to right. be able to... But, but you could use peer review, too. itself, we wouldn't have to do every single student. Could we do a sample of absolute everybody? Sample of everybody? Well, I mean, you know... <laughs> <laughs> One yeah. course, two courses a semester. Yeah. Yeah, because you're probably not going to get everybody on board. Oh! Hell no. <laughs> Cut that. Um, that is oh, sorry. <laughs> You're being reported. <laughs> yeah, but then there's a few people that would that would do it. It would that would be really fun to do. I yeah, think it would be super else. fun. Yeah. yeah. And these guys actually it, the people who lead these CLA workshops, they're really good at this and they'll actually come. So if your department is interested, you can hire them to come, come for a day and work work through these, develop several of those scenarios that you could then pull out and use. Okay. And there, there is lots of other authentic assessment that I haven't talked about. So like problem-based learning, you know, John Armstrong I know is really big on that. He started to implement that in his physics class. That's a form of authentic assess assessment. Students are presented with a, a real-world problem and they will work on it throughout the semester. Um, Problem-based learning. Um, what else is there? I mean, there's just lots, of, lots of different types. Like when we do simulations. Oh, simulation. Simulation. Exactly, simulations. Yeah. 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 A lot of uh, in health professions, they've got the yeah. mannequins and, and things like that. Very authentic. I mean, it makes sounds, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> semester and they're getting these AR 1 through 10, so throughout the semester, so there's 10 chapters, so there's different little handouts that they get. And so if we're learning about a certain concept in that chapter, then we have these five questions that we actually pose to them and they actually have to go and go to an annual report of a public company uh -huh. that they've picked, maybe it's somebody they love or a hobby or somewhere they shop off, and they have to actually dig in and go into the real world of saying, okay, how is it, what we're learning, apply right. yeah. to some real world stuff. Yeah, and what can you learn about that company based upon what you just learned in class? Yeah. yeah. So there, there are a lot, again, they're just they're a little more time intensive, but tend to be pretty intensive. But they do, they look for more guidance, just like, well, oh, you know, what's your written report, and, well, do you want us to answer one, two, three, no, you know, get, go through, and, you know, answer these questions and talk about okay, this is where they, this is what they produce, this yeah. company, and this is their sources of revenue, and, and maybe you know, where are they located, and are they worldwide, or and then we start digging into the details of it all. But. 
Yeah, so that may be. That may be. There's not a huge amount of, there's limited guidance. Yeah, exactly. But it allows for them to really be creative and go in and uh, they want Yeah, and that may be the biggest challenge is getting students over that. And I guess you do it by making sure that they're not penalized by thinking out of the box too much, right? No, I'm not, you can't say, do what you want and then come back and say, no, you were supposed to do this. Well, we gave them guidelines. Yeah, and so the format, that, you know, and make sure that the sections are identified so we know what to address them. Yeah. The, the charts and graphs and written stuff in. And I would imagine already, I think a lot of instructors already do this, especially as students move through their curriculum. And the, the senior seminar and capstone sort of thing is much more what you get at 1,000 or 2,000 All right.